Hey guys, this is Johan and Sean's beside me. We're back at the Ontario Regiment Museum, Canada's largest museum with an operating fleet of vehicles. And today we're going to talk about the M483EH Sherman that they've got here. Now, we can tell it's an M483E8 and not an M4A1, for example, because it's got a welded hull compared to the cast hull on the earlier A1 model, as well as a long 76 millimeter gun, which we'll talk more about later. Also with us is Frank Moore, a member at the museum. Good morning. Yeah. Yep. So Frank, you're the guy who uh, maintains this tank. Can you tell us a bit about it? Well, uh, it is one of the American Bill Shermans. Uh, I found that this one has a build date of November 1944. It was built by the Fisher Body Division of General Motors and the gun I find out after looking after it for a while it was made by Oldsmobile Division of General Motors. So this is a real American product. It is and it shows the support that the automotive industry gave us during the Second World War. Right now the Easy 8 marked a noted uh, departure from traditional American anti-tank and armor philosophy. Up to this point, American anti-tank philosophy was for light vehicles that move fast and hit hard, like the Wolverine and the Hellcat. And American armor philosophy was for uh, vehicles that were mainly in the infantry support. The Easy 8 to some extent harmonized these roles, being inspired by the Sherman Firefly, a British and Commonwealth vehicle, with the, uh, with the heavier cannon that could, to some extent, pierce more armor, as well as uh, use the, as well as operate in the infantry support role. However, this tank was still not up to German standards, or at least it, armor-wise, it could not compete with the German tanks very well. At the front, we've got 75 millimeters of sloped armor, and on the sides, we've got 35 millimeters of armor. However, the German tanks were able to penetrate this tank at basically any range they wanted, which Again, it's a fact we'll talk about later. So now let's climb over to the back and check out what powers this thing, Frank. Well, it's powered by two General Motors Model 671 diesel engines that are geared together. And each engine has its own clutch, so that if there is a failure in one of the engines, it can be declutched, shut down, and although you cut your power in half, you can still drive the tank. Right, so let's go check it out. All right. Okay, so now we're on top of the engine deck. Can you show me the bits and bobs in here? Okay, well down below here you can see one of the two uh, 671 General Motors diesels. They're a two-stroke engine. Um, six times the 71 will give you total cubic inch displacement of each engine. Uh, total horsepower is 375 of the pair. They are joined at the front end by a large gearbox and each engine has its own clutch. And if there's an engine failure, you can lock out one engine and drive on the other side with, of course, half the horsepower. But at least you're still moving and you can still fight the vehicle. To the right here, we see the three big air cleaners. These are what we call oil bath air cleaners. And when the uh, tanks were serving in the desert especially, and in most other locations as well, these air cleaners would have to be taken out and cleaned every day. And the beauty of the oil bath air cleaner is you can take them all apart clean out the dirt, wash them, and put them all back together with fresh oil, and it was just like having brand new air cleaners again. Right. On top of the engines, we have the, uh, the engine hatches here, and they're designed to resist penetration by shells and other debris, and inside we have louvers, and these louvers can be opened and closed depending on the requirements of things like temperature, so that you'd have them closed when, when everything is cold, open when things are hot, and by closing them, the fans, which are directly under this deck here, and they blow out the back, they will pull air through that heat exchanger down there, which is also drawing the air out of the fighting compartment. So every time you open the breech and you get this smoke coming out, it gets sucked through there and blown out the back to try and clear your fighting compartment for the next round. Right. In order to, uh, to look after the engines, you've got things like the fuel filter right there, we have the cap here that covers the two dipsticks, so you check the oil before you start the engines. Up on this corner over here, in the far corner behind the little guard, is a cap for gasoline. Inside the tank there is a small gasoline-driven generator, and that, we call it an APU, auxiliary power unit. It will run the electrical system in the tank, including the radio and the lights, the ventilation, while the engines are shut down. 
That keeps your batteries up and you don't have to run main engines wasting fuel just to run the interior equipment if you're sitting on station for a long time. The charging set can also direct heat to the engine batteries and to the engines themselves. Over here we have the water cap, which is where you check the rad, just like in a car. Forward of that is the lubrication oil cap, and underneath that is a big screw cap, and that's where you add engine oil when necessary. And then the cap that is further out on the slant there, you open that one up, and that's where you fill up the fuel. And there's a second set of caps on this side, except for the one for the gasoline. What we have on this side is the air intake for, for the ventilation system inside the turret. All right, so I guess uh, we can talk about the turret itself and then head inside now. Sure. Okay, so now we're in the turret. Uh, Frank, why don't you tell us a bit about the weapon system for now and the ammunition it used? Well, this is our 76 millimeter uh, high explosive round. It has the time delay mechanism here, and this is set by a fuse setter, a device that clips over the end of the round and turns this band, and there are tiny numbers along here to indicate the actual time delay that the shell will experience after it begins its flight. When the shell is loaded and fired, the propellant case then sends the projectile forward in the barrel, and this copper driving band will engage the rifling in the barrel, which starts it to spin. And as it starts it spinning, this small mechanism here is actually wound up. There's a spring in here, and it's wound up. And during flight after the time period, it is released and does this. And that snap is what sets off the round. And the round, uh, contains a pound and a half of high explosive. Other types of rounds that are available for the tank are the armor piercing, and instead of having this point on here, it'll have a soft copper cap, which of course, when it strikes something, the, the cap is crushed, and there's a pin inside, very, very sharp, and when that makes contact, the charge within is set off, and it will actually burn its way through the armor. There's also things like uh, star shell, there's smoke shell, uh, just depends on what it is you're shooting at and under what circumstances as to what projectile you would use. The entire round hits about 26 to 28 pounds when it's full. This one here, the propellant casing is empty so it's, it's quite a bit lighter. There's uh, 71 of these in the, uh, in the stowage inside the tank and in this particular tank it's called wet stowage. Surrounding the pigeon holes that these rounds will go into are uh, water cavities that are filled with antifreeze. And this is to try and reduce the chance of ignition of the rounds if the tank is hit and set on fire. That gives the crew a chance to escape. In our use of this uh, machine here at the museum, I use these shortened saluting rounds. And I can put a pound and a half of black powder in here and put that up the spout and we can fire off salutes or have uh, ceremonial firings with veterans or as you'll see at our Aquino weekend, we actually do demonstration firing during a reenactment. Right, so uh, let's climb in and we'll show how we load up the tank with ammunition. Okay. So John, if you'll come over here to help us out. All right, we're going to load the, the round into the, into the vehicle now. And unlike the heavier German weapons, this could only penetrate hostile armor at about 100 meters. So, pass this in. And it goes right down here. And here's our round going to go down into the pigeonhole. And you see what we have here is these caps. That's where the antifreeze is added into the water jackets to uh, try and reduce the chance of fire setting off these rounds uh, if the tank is struck and of course the interior is on fire. This gives us a delay so that the uh, crew can possibly escape. If they can't get out through these two hatches here and go over to that far corner at the front and tip the co-driver's seat forward, there's an escape hatch right there. It just drops out of the bottom of the tank. 
hopefully there's enough room under the tank that you can squirm out.